Yes, good morning, Sabbath School. I hope you've been blessed this past week as you have been about your various activities. And uh, we hope that as you worship with us this Sabbath that you will receive an even greater blessing as we open God's Word. <clears throat> it's nice that it's a little cooler. Did some of you actually get some rain this week? I had a few drops on my windshield, which was uh, very nice to see. In fact, I'd like to see it rain for a whole day just to kind of wet everything down, layer the dust down, clean things up, and give us a chance to kind of get back uh, to a little bit more of what we expect here in Oregon. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> as we begin our Sabbath school, I invite you to bow your heads at this time. We'll have a opening prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you that you have blessed and protected us this past week. But we thank you especially that you've given us this Sabbath. We ask that you would please send your Holy Spirit to be present, to guide us, and direct us, and to help us understand the times that we live in and how you would have us live in those times. Thank you now for hearing and for answering this prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, we will have Mission Spotlight. Vietnam is one of the most visited countries for tourism in Southeast Asia. It offers so many exciting things for its visitors, from the breathtaking vistas of Halong Bay to promising business opportunities in the city, Hanoi is the place to be for tourists and locals alike. With a population of 9 million living in the city, there is only a small number of Adventists. Yet this is an opportunity for the church to reach more people for Christ. The Adventists here constructed a seven-story building as an urban center of influence in Hanoi to meet the needs of the local community. Uh, on our first floor, we have a bookstore that is open to the community where people can come in and uh, purchase books that can help them to grow in their walk with the Lord. We have an uh, English language school that we are able to build relationships with individuals. We are reaching out to the community by uh, ministering to uh, children that are needing help with their education. The church meets here in the building uh, on a regular basis. From healthy cooking classes to a running club that meets every Sunday morning, they have a lot of fun with their community. The center's activities have allowed them to build strong partnerships and even friendships with government officials. An opportunity has arisen for us to partner with the uh, Religious Affairs Committee of uh, Vietnam and we are teaching English there on, in their building to 28 of their staff members, uh, all the way from uh, receptionists, secretaries, to uh, the top of the Religious Affairs Committee. Through these activities, the center's workers and volunteers hope to be a shining example of Christ's method of ministry. They want to share and introduce Christ's love to everyone. Without this purpose, this building is only a building like any other. The Center of Influence is just that. It's a, it's a place to, to provide influence. It's a place that influences the community. It's a place that uh, provides space and opportunity for the church to, to meet and mingle with people, to uh, build relationships, friendships, to, to build trust and to win their confidence. And when the opportunity arises to offer them a relationship with Jesus Christ. With growing demand for their services, this ministry is also facing some serious challenges. But the challenges are, are real. It's a city of nine million people. The church here in the Hanoi area is small, so we don't have a lot of manpower to, uh, to draw from in uh, working in the center of influence here. We need volunteers to fulfill the calls that we have out uh, we need volunteers from the local church uh, to partner with us in the ministry. We have calls out for international volunteers to come. Uh, we have not had a lot of response from that yet. And so uh, we're still needing people to come and uh, do ministry here from abroad. 
Despite challenges and setbacks, God is still using His workers to bless others. Some of the students in the center's English class have gotten a glimpse of Christ's character through their teachers. They are all really pa pa patient. Yeah, really, really patient. That's what I, I cannot see in the, some other, you know, language center or something. Uh, I feel refreshed because the teacher here, you know, that they is friendly, generous, and they try to close their student here. To see people come to the, the language classes and then they, they start coming to church and you know that God is at work, that He is doing things. God can work miracles, so we're looking forward to seeing what He has in store for us. Please pray for this urban center of influence in Vietnam. Pray so that the Lord of the harvest will open hearts and send more laborers to this place. If you feel impressed to serve, visit vividfaith.org to browse open calls from around the world. Please support projects like this through Global Mission. All right, we are on lesson 11 today. I want to remind you that we are here for a purpose. And I want us to remember that we are here to treat people the way we have been treated by God. Has, um, are things happening fast enough for you? You'd like it to slow down a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in Glasgow this past week on Sunday, there was an organization that met in conjunction with the G7 climate crisis conference that has been taking place there. And it was a celebration and a call for Climate Sundays to promote saving the planet from climate disaster. And that took place on Sunday, this last Sunday, at the Glasgow Cathedral. And it was, the goal was, is that it would represent 50,000 worshiping Christian communities in the UK would be participating or represented by this service that was going to take place calling for Climate Sundays, something that should resonate with us. Did anybody recognize the fact that tyranny has arrived in America? It has. And I would ask that you make this a matter of prayer, um, that our leaders will have wisdom in terms of how to respond. Um, I never dreamed that I would see these things. And my guess is most of you didn't either. Read Revelation 13, 16, and 17. I think it's good to be reminded. Last uh, two weeks ago, I made you aware of the seminar that was held at the Village SDA Church in uh, Berrien Springs, COVID, Coercion and Conscience. All of those presentations have been banned on Facebook. kind of gives you a sense as to what's happening. They were taken off YouTube as well. Uh, on YouTube, yes, thank you. Um, however, they are still available. So if you want to go to villagesda.org, they are still, you can still view them, downloading them from them directly. But um, again, this gives us a sense as to the times that we're living in, a time to look at seriously. So let's look at lesson 11. I have re- titled this um, lesson, 
as follows. Longing for more, and it sort of stopped there. More what? More rest. Have you ever wakened in the morning, your alarm clock goes off, and you think, oh, man, I wish I could just sleep for another 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. I need more rest. My guess is that every one of you are blessed by the Sabbath rest that you experience from week to week. Okay? But I want you to try and learn today, and I, I, I hope I can accomplish this, because I actually put together this lesson last night, and then I completely redid it again, trying to figure out how to get this all packed together, unpacked, so that, in fact, it makes some sense. But we're going to be looking primarily today at, at Hebrews 4. And that means that it's not going to follow exactly your lesson study, which I don't typically do. Typically, I try to follow the lesson study sort of through it so that we, you know, cover that material. But I'm going to look at this a little differently, and we're going to looking, be looking at Hebrews 4. Now, before we look at Hebrews 4, I want you just to consider the memory text, which reads as follows. This is in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. It says, Now, these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Now, if you look at that verse, it's kind of like, what are we talking about? Who's, what, are we, what, are, what examples are we talking about? Who are they? What are we supposed to learn? Nothing really is identified. So let us look at where this comes from. And let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 11. And I want to not spend a lot of time on this, but I want to focus on it as follows. Look at the highlighted parts. Verse 1, it says, Paul speaking, he says, I do not want you to be unaware. What does that mean? I don't want you to be surprised, somebody said. I don't want you to be uninformed. I want you to have information so that you will correctly understand what the real issues are. There is nothing worse than going into a meeting with a certain set of information that you think is pertinent to the meeting, only to discover that when you get in the meeting, you have the wrong information. You don't know what's really going on, and you are sitting there trying to catch up. <clears throat> now, at the bottom of this text, it says, they were overthrown in the wilderness. That implies that if one is unaware, the outcome could be what? Bad. What does it mean to be overthrown? Overcome, okay. You, you weren't able to deal with the situation. Okay, so lack of information can lead to bad outcomes. Now let's continue on. Verse 6, again, 1 Corinthians verse 10. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. That's the memory text that we just read a moment ago. Continuing on, verse 7, highlighted. Do not... Just look at that. Do not. There's a warning here. Look at verse 8. We must what? Not. Again, a warning. And then verse 9. We must not. Apparently there are things that we need to be very careful about because if we do them, bad outcomes. So God's warning us. Verse 11. Now these things happened to them. We don't know who they are as examples, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Now I want you to focus on those last three circled words or phrases. Them, our, and what is the time frame that Paul is writing about here 
in terms of this warning, these examples that he's talking about. What is the time frame? End of the ages. End of the ages. That's exactly right. right now. Exactly. So we're looking at a, a warning here that Paul is bringing to our attention that has relevance for us as individuals today and the time that we live in and there are lessons that we need to learn in relationship to something that happened to them back there. We're going to sl skip the next three slides because I don't think we have time. Okay. Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 11. Now, I hope that God's Spirit will help me understand and know how to present this to you so that you follow what is being said here. Let's read it as follows. Verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Again, I want you to focus on the highlighted words. The promise, his rest, and what is the last word there that is highlighted? Fear. Okay. So Paul is identifying that God has something that he wants to give to you and I. He's promised it to us. He describes it as his rest. But Paul is very clear that there is a possibility of what? There's a possibility that we may not get the rest. In other words, we need to be afraid that there is, that we need to be um, concerned about the possibility that we may actually miss the entire issue. And as a result, not enter into the rest. Now, what the rest is, is not identified. It's just identified as his rest. Now, I want you to go with me to two verses in the book of Psalms. Psalms 95, verses 7 through 9 and verse 11 read as follows. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me, they tried me, though they had seen what I did. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest." Okay, let's look at a couple words. Meribah, ha? Huh? I, I, I apologize, I don't know quite how to pronounce those, but Meribah, ha? Huh? And Masa. Do those words ring a bell in your mind? All right, little review. Exodus 17, verses 3 through 7 reads. But the people thirsted for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Continuing on, And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Masaha and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? 
You remember the story now. Israel has been released from Egypt. They have been uh, saved from the attack of the Egyptians by walking across the Red Sea in, on, on dry land, the divided sea on dry land. They have been provided food. And yet when they come to a situation where they don't have water or they're running out of water, they completely forget everything that God has done for them. And what do they do? They start grumbling and mumbling and casting about doubt that in fact God is able to do anything for them. And in fact, they wish they could go where? Back to Egypt. What did they do in Egypt? What do slaves do? They worked. They wanted to go back to Egypt and work. All right. Back to Hebrews. Verse 2. For good news came to us, just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Verse 3. For we who have believed entered that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So Paul is here contrasting what? Paul is contrasting them who did not believe, who did not have faith, and who did not enter into rest versus believing which allows one to indeed receive rest. Now, let's look at verse, continuing on, look at verse 4. Uh, lo, let's finish up the above. Although his work was finished from the foundation of the work, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Now, Hebrews 4 is an interesting chapter because it is used by many people. It's interesting how uh, we, we face this conundrum today in the world today. Um, have you ever, have you ever um, read something or you listen to two people read the same thing and they seem to come down on diametrically opposite positions on the same piece of information? I mean, that seems to be the way it works today in everything that we deal with here. Hebrews 4, some people look at Hebrews 4 and say, aha, this supports seventh day, Sabbath, weekly worship. I mean, it's right there. However, it's interesting that there are other people who say, ah, no, 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 no. Hebrews 4 doesn't really have anything to do with seventh day Sabbath worship. It simply says that you need to worship on a day in the week. You can choose whichever day it is. And, and go your way, do your own thing. Yeah, I, no, it's, it's interesting how that is. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to suggest that, in fact, that really isn't the point of what Hebrews 4 is all about. So let's see if we can continue on and make some sense out of this. Verse 6, Hebrews 4, verse 6. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appointed a certain day, saying through David, so long afterwards, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, 
do not harden your hearts. So again, what is the point that Paul is making here? Um, they failed to receive the rest because of what? Disobedience. Okay. So let me just tag into what you just said here. What is disobedience evidence of? Not believing. Not believing. Not trusting. Okay. Another way of saying disobedience, what disobedience is, is when you and I say, which I unfortunately have said more than once in my life, I have a better way. I have a better idea as to how this should be sorted out. And that's, of course, the whole problem that even Adam and Eve had back in the Garden of Eden. They knew what God had said. In fact, there's a dialogue that takes place with Eve and the serpent. And she, she understood, but she had a better idea. And certainly Adam seemed to think that he had a better idea too. So <clears throat> now, what is it that David is talking about? So let's look at where, so Paul is now quoting something that David said long afterwards. And it's today, if your hearts do not, uh, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So let's find out and see what that is all about. <clears throat> Oh man, I hope I didn't mess something up here. Um, so, Psalms 96 reads as follows. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and let the hills and, and all that fill it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes... For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. Amen. So when, and, and I, I was, I, I thought I had pulled out the text here that says, where it says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. I think that is in, in Psalms 96 somewhere, and I don't have it here, and I apologize for that. But the point is, is that what Paul, excuse me, what David is talking about here is he is referring to an event that is going to take place in the future. And what is that event? Second coming. Second coming. That's exactly right. So now we're connecting rest with what event? Second coming. All right. Now, did you find it? Okay. I must have somehow passed. Um, I somehow left that out. But anyway, it's in there. Okay, that's where Paul... So the point is, is that <clears throat> when... What, what, what Paul is referencing here is he's looking at what David has said, and David now in turn is looking at what is going to happen in the future. <clears throat> so let us now look at this last part here. Verse 8, Hebrews 4, verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Now, and then he continues on verse 11. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Now, what is Paul talking about here?
we look at, at the seventh day Sabbath as a day of rest, correct? Is that, is that, is there any salvation in the seventh day Sabbath rest? Can somebody say no also? <laughs> okay, because the, the reason I ask, I say that is because I believe the answer is yes and no. Okay. Um, it is easy for us to think of the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath rest as primarily physical rest. I mean, I can remember when I was in college, I, there was, I loved Friday night because Friday night I could rest. I could put away the books, put away everything that had to be done. And for 24 hours, I could rest. And it was glorious. It was glorious. But the seventh day Sabbath rest is also a foreshadow of something much more. Because our salvation within the seventh day Sabbath is not anything that we do but rather, everything that we are. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? Notice what it says down below. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Is that a oxymoron? Striving and rest? What is Paul saying here? There's spiritual rest, physical rest. Okay. What was the problem with them out in the wilderness when they ran out of water? They lacked what? Faith. They were not willing to trust God to solve the problem. They were ready to do what? Go back to... And do what? Work. And I believe that what Paul is talking about here in, 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 in Hebrews 4 is that so often we look at our salvation as something that we have to work for. It is something that we do, and therefore we are rewarded that salvation. And what Paul is saying here in Hebrews 4, in referencing back to the children of Israel out in the wilderness when they ran out of water, is they never received the rest that God intended for them because they lacked what? Love for God. Faith. Yeah. They were not willing to trust in God. And that generation, what happened to them? They died in the wilderness. They never received the rest which was intended for them on the other side of the Jordan River. So, when when the lesson here titles longing for more, what is the more part? Yes. It is resting in the, in the promise that Christ is given that he is adequate to save us. Amen. All we have to do is trust him. 
and follow where he leads. Now that, I believe, is where the striving comes in, <laughs> okay? Because sometimes we have a tendency to go off on our own rabbit trails, okay? But nevertheless, it is within that context that you and I, living in these days, can have rest. I don't know about you, but I have interacted with multiple people in the last, well, it seems to be getting more actually as time goes by here, but in the last month, people who are very concerned about what's happening, people who are afraid, people who are scared, people who don't know, don't understand what's going on. You and I, have through what what God has revealed to us the ability to have more rest Amen. now um, let's just continue with a couple things here um, that I think is important for us to keep in mind Hebrews 4 verse 12 reads as follows for the word of God is living and active it's sharper than any two or two-edged short sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hmm, what are we talking about here? Isn't that the same as that in the Bible? One time I read it, and the thing that strikes you was the church of the Bible, and it changes it to more. Okay, yep, I agree. It, we can, we can learn new things every time we read something through. But there's something here that I think is at, is at play here that is important. And that is, what is the issue that we struggle with oftentimes? What is the issue that the Israelites struggled with out there in the wilderness? On the one hand, they were scared because they were running out of water. And so their natural instinct was, let's solve this ourselves. Let's head back to Egypt. Okay? The flip side of the coin is, there's also the promise, all the evidence that God had given them, that in fact he was more than capable of solving their problem. And thus the word helps us keep clear what is going on. On the right path. On the right path. That's exactly right. Um, and so we... Uh, The thoughts and intentions of the heart are divided over whether we will trust ourselves or whether we will trust God. Yep. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, so let's just review here. Uh, Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 11 is summarized. Verse 6. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news fail to enter because of disobedience. Disobedience here is not in reference to are we lying, stealing, uh, doing those kinds of things. This, this disobedience here is the disobedience of not trusting, not trusting uh, that God can solve the problem and in fact provide us with a complete salvation. Last but not least, Paul continues with um, verses 13 and 14, looking at verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. We face the same challenge that Israel faced out in the wilderness. Where are we going to get water from? 
There's no water. God provided it. And he will provide for you and I also. Last but not least, <clears throat> let us therefore with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Again, this is a call for faith, trust. This is a call to not go back and try to earn what God has accomplished for us already. And so in summary, Hebrews 4 does reference the seventh day, the weekly seventh day Sabbath rest that we experience. We believe that that's founded in the very beginning of everything that God has created. But let us never forget that he also has a rest that is in the future. It is a rest that you and I can experience today through faith, through trust, because he has a much greater Sabbath rest for you and I than just the rest that we experience here today. Closing thought, I'll just read the highlighted parts. We are not always willing to come to Jesus with our trials and difficulties. Sometimes we pour our troubles into human ears and tell our afflictions to those who cannot help us and neglect to confide all to Jesus, who is able to change the sorrowful ways to paths of joy and peace. Self-denying, self-sacrificing gives glory and victory to the cross. The words of inspiration carefully studied and practically obeyed will lead our feet, feet in a plain path where we, may, where we may walk without stumbling. Amen. And then in the very below, he will never forsake those who put their trust in him. Yes. It is within that context that you and I can expect more rest in God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you know each individual situation. We thank you that you know where each of your believers are around the world. And we thank you that angels are with each one. Forgive us for when we have desired to go back and work, to be slaves, and help us to learn to live by trusting in you, knowing that you can indeed complete our salvation. Please bless us now as we continue to worship you this Sabbath. May we not only be physically refreshed but may we also be spiritually blessed. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.